Hey everybody, my name is Paul Isden Jr. aka Boy Green. Welcome to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash boygreen25. We're going to continue to break down every free agent signing for the New York Jets with expert analysis on today's episode. We're going to sit down with Michael Rothstein, who covers the Detroit Lions as an NFL Nation reporter for ESPN. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Sure. Let's jump right in. The first signing the Jets made, despite having over $70 million in cap space, was adding linebacker Gerard Davis, formerly of the Detroit Lions, on a one-year deal, $5.5 million fully guaranteed. Can, or, can earn up to $7 million with incentives. Originally, he was a first-round pick, Michael, and I was reading some of your pre-draft articles way back when uh, on Gerard Davis, and I want to go back to the beginning. What did Detroit like about Gerard coming uh, out of Florida? Well, he's a high character guy, and that was something that the prior regime, Bob Quinn specifically and Jim Caldwell, really put a premium on. They liked finding players that maybe had high floors, even if they had lower ceilings, but they also knew that largely would stay out of trouble, too. In Jared Davis, they got all of those things. They got a very hard worker, a work ethic type player, and a guy who could make plays, a guy who was very good against the run and maybe could put some pass pressure in there. And that was really the guy that they took. They took a guy that they really believed that a lot of people, if you remember at that time, it was Ruben Foster or Jerry Davis. And Jerry Davis felt like the more plug and play guy. Maybe Ruben Foster had a little bit more upside, but also there was a lot more questions surrounding him too. TJ Watt was also in that class, but he was at a different position theoretically because Jerry Davis is more of a middle linebacker And I don't think really got as much consideration, but you look now hindsight four years later and TJ Watt would have been the better selection for probably any team in like the 15 to whenever he was taken range. Well, obviously his career hasn't played out the way he wanted it being Davis or uh, what the lines would have projected. How big of an impact was the switching of guard at head coach in the middle of Davis's career? I mean, I think it was a big deal because they did. They drafted Davis to be one thing, and then the defense so drastically shifted that they were asking Jared Davis to be another thing. And Jared Davis, to me, he is what he is. He's not a bad player by any stretch of the imagination. He's one of these players, and we've seen it all across the league with every team for time immemorial, as long as the dra- people have covered the draft and paid attention, that draft position – through no fault of a player's own, will sometimes dictate expectations fairly or unfairly. And I think that that happened in Jared Davis's case because there are things that Jared Davis does do well, but as a first-round pick, you're expecting your first-round pick to be a pro bowler. You're expecting your first-round pick to be a guy that's going to be a starter for you for a decade. And Jared Davis just wasn't any an impact player. And Jared Davis just wasn't any of – those things so i think for that reason i apologize for the continuing this is free agency right you hear the the buzzing in the background all the time that to me is i think where where things maybe got lost for jared davis there are things he does well i think he's good against the run i think he's good rushing the passer putting him in coverage is not a good idea it's just not something he has done well or has ever really done well He's admittedly even struggled with it a little bit early in his career, but he's a work ethic guy. He's one of those like first guys in, last guys out, really good locker room guy as well. But if on when you're talking about on the field, it's going to be a lot of run stops, making that diagnosis, and some pass rush where he showed really good potential in a delayed pass rush situation. And it's funny, I was reading your article, so a pre-draft, you guys did a mock draft and the NFL Nation reporters normally do that, and that's pre-COVID, obviously, uh, when that happened a couple of years ago. And one of the players you said that you considered that if it would have been on the board is Corey Davis, and it's funny, the Jets ended up signing him as well in free agency. And the point you just made is where they're drafted and how expectations change. The players don't pick where they're drafted. Corey Davis ended up being a top five pick and all these expectations were thrown on him. And then when he's not that, all of a sudden he's a bust. He's not what he was supposed to be. So I think it's interesting that you make that point. Right, Paul. I mean, that's part of it. But there's, I mean, even with the Lions, you can look back. Eric Ebron, number 10 overall. Eric Eric Ebron's not a bad player. He's made a Pro Bowl. He has some problems with his hands here and there, but he's gotten better. And he's a guy who's probably in the top, what, 15 or so of tight ends in the NFL. Not, Not bad at all. He was always in Detroit. 
caught in the problem of the people that the Lions didn't draft behind him, Taylor Lewan, Odell Beckham, Aaron Donald at a position they really needed, even Ryan Shazier. Like there was Zach, uh, Zach Martin. Like there's just those guys, like sometimes the higher you get picked, like that's just what happens. I mean, I think you, you see it every year with certain players, depending on the market, depending on the team. And uh, let's talk about Davis for a second. How versatile is he? Because uh, we've seen a lot of him where, as you said, a middle linebacker just playing Mike linebacker. And then in others, we're trying to figure out what he means with the Jets because CJ Mosley currently is the Jets middle linebacker. So uh, his future has suddenly been thrown into question as well. How versatile is Davis? You know, I don't think anyone really knows because one of the knocks on Jared Davis had nothing to do with Jared Davis. It had to do with how he was being used and the coaching that he was receiving within that Matt Patricia defensive scheme. And you've seen that with a bunch of players. I think there are a few players that you look at, some that are still on the Lions now, some that are no longer on the Lions that just were never used particularly well or put in really unadvantageous positions and they go somewhere else and they flourish. That's a possibility for Jared Davis. I've watched enough Jared Davis that I don't think it was necessarily a scheme problem. It was a can they put him in the right position for what he does well? Problem. And like I said before, coverage, you don't want him in coverage. You don't want him having to necessarily go side to side. You don't necessarily want him to have to, you know, shed a double block type situation. You want him to be maybe that added rusher in a pass rush situation that can be a little, off a little bit of a delay because he can get past a single block and get to the quarterback with pretty good speed, pretty good downline speed. And he's very instinctually good against the run. Now, sometimes he does get caught in, in blocks and he can get better at that still. He's still a fairly young guy. So I think there's still room to improve. And, and in those situations too, sometimes it's tough to tell because you don't know what the scheme is necessarily in the front. So he might be in the right spot and think he's going to have an open path and then someone up front messes up and he all of a sudden looks like he's, you know, getting pancaked into the ground and it's really not his fault. So I think that what we've seen from Davis so far, I think there's a lot of potential in different areas, just as long as you're not putting him in coverage. If the Jets decide to put him in coverage, then I really don't know what they're doing or he has gotten miraculously better at something he wasn't good at over four seasons. Right, and that seems uh, less likely to be the case. Again, Michael Rothstein, who covers the Detroit Lions for ESPN, joining us here. And uh, I guess let me ask you about the prowess as a pass rusher. Ten and a half career sacks, that's intriguing. Is that something uh, the Lions expected when they drafted him? I don't know if they expected it when they drafted him. Um, I think it's something that they were experimenting with over the last couple of years because he showed a knack for it. So they would use it from time to time. And it's tough to even gauge some of those numbers because the Lions just never really pressured the quarterback. And by that, I mean really blitzed, which is five or, five or more rushers. So at that point, you're, you're not even sending Davis a lot. You're not getting him those, run, those reps that he might need to do that. So to me, I think there's some untapped potential there as a pass rusher especially if you can move him around a little bit like I don't know if the Jets are going to play a 4-3 or a 3-4 but if he's maybe that second inside linebacker that you have some faith in as a pass rusher and you can bring him in on maybe a delayed stunt or something like that then I think that there's real value there like I said as long as he's not the guy that's having a you know cover the running back out of the backfield or cover the tight end or getting put up against a slot receiver like he, he can play and there are things he can do. It's just that that to me is when he gets in trouble. Yeah. Let's get another layer on that coverage. Again, all the advanced metrics say exactly what you're saying is that he is uh, terrible and struggles in coverage by every major metric that you can look at. I saw that uh, through Twitter, I was just kind of doing searches uh, between, uh, you know, any of your articles and insights on Davis. And a lot of these conversations you had is where Davis kind of, just said to you that I think I could be good in coverage. I just missed this. I just missed that. When you look at it from a coverage standpoint, is it a mental thing for him? He seems super athletic. It seems like physically he could be capable of covering. It just seems like the production just simply isn't there. You know, I don't know. That, that's, that's a really good question, Paul. And I think some of it maybe has to go do with scheme, you know, because especially for front seven guys, especially linebackers, 
part of why you're successful or you're not successful in coverage is because of the scheme that you're in and what you're being asked to do. Like if you're being asked to play a zone and you're, you know, you're mounting an area, well, if they pick on you in that area, you're not going to look very good in coverage. Um, if it's more man and you're just getting beat, well then, you know, that's a different set of problems. So I think that's part of it. I think that's going to be up to Robert Sala to figure out what might work best for Jared Davis and, and how they can best use him. And if they feel like there is any, anything salvageable in coverage, and let's be honest, if he's not a good coverage linebacker, that's not the end of the world. There are plenty of linebackers out there that make their money as run stoppers and pass rushers. And you're just not that versatile three down guy, but how many of those are there really in the NFL? Because let's be honest, if you, if you are that type of guy, you're probably not even hitting free agency. Let, or, or you're hitting free agency in kind of like a Levante David way, right? Where it's like you're hitting free agency, but not really. I don't know if you can see this. Like hitting free agency, like you're like you're getting a deal. You're going to get a lucrative situation. Like Jared Davis just doesn't have that from a pass coverage standpoint. Um, everything else is there, like intangibly. Like as far as like I said, locker room, like co coaches guy, like he's all that people could want. And there are things that he's shown that he can be capable at on the field. It's just, again, even with some of those things that he's shown he can be capable at, pass rush, run fits, he needs to be doing it more consistently. And I think, frankly, a new scheme and a, a new breath of fresh air will help him immensely. And, the fa and frankly, the fact, too, that, sure, he's still a first-round pick, but he no longer has that first-round pick um, tag to him. Because he's with a new team, I think that could very much help. Because listen, we all know I grew up. I grew up in New York. Like, if you are a first round pick, no matter what position you are, you're getting a certain amount of attention from the back pages of the New York Post and the Daily News. Doesn't matter if you're a quarterback or you're a safety or you're an offensive guard. All right, maybe not an offensive guard, but like, I don't think Jared Davis is going to have to worry about that. Now, he didn't get that type of attention in Detroit. Understand? But like, there was still some attention play, paid to him. Because people were asking, he was a first-round pick. Why didn't he ever put it together? Well, now if he's average to above average with the Jets this year, then no one's going to be asking those questions anymore because he's more now paid commensurate with maybe what he's able to do. And then if he plays well, then it's like, wow, they got a steal. Can you keep him long-term? So the, I think this is a more advantageous position for Jared Davis to be in at this point in his career than if he had stayed, say, in Detroit, where it's like you st even with the new offense, the new defense, the new scheme, and they seem to really like him in Detroit, the new coaching staff, you, you, you're, you're putting yourself in that same position still. And I don't know why you would necessarily want to do that. So I think this is just a good fit overall for Jared Davis. Plus, he's in a city that, you know, new listen, New York loves their pro teams. New York loves their football. But at the same time, like, there's a lot going on. It's not like some places where like football is it. Yeah. And again, a lot of great points there. Again, we're speaking with Michael Rostein. Just a couple more before we get you out of here. NFL film shared some in-game clips recently and showed some fire, some energy uh, from Davis. What kind of personality uh, is he? What kind of uh, person, what kind of man are they getting? That's something it seems like the Jets and Robert Sala really pride themselves on is the, is the person that's coming in as well. So again, not just the, the personality as well, which again, it seemed like he's a really fiery, emotional guy, but also what kind of man is he? Yeah, he, he listen, he's a good character guy. He's a guy that will do a lot in the community. He was part of their leadership committee or leadership council, rather. He was one of the people that really pushed to help get masks made with the Empowerment Plan, which is a local nonprofit here. Uh, he's, he's a good citizen good NFL citizen of the community. I mean, that like, that's what they're getting off the field. Like he's not going to be a flashy guy. He's not going to be a guy that you're going to hear much like of him getting in trouble or anything like that. Like, that's just not who Jared Davis is. Like he's just literally this guy who really likes football and is interested in some other stuff, but is also somewhat resident red, reticent to maybe share some of that other stuff, but maybe again, a change of scenery helps that because uh, you know, he's not seeing the same faces every day for, really three of his four years. And then this year, occasionally in situations like this on zoom. And uh, last one, before we get you out of here, this is non uh, Jared Davis related, but it just hit me when you mentioned Robert Sala, 
prior to the season ending, a lot of people seemed to think it was a foregone conclusion that the Lions and Sala were going to happen. Uh, the family ties, that letter where all the politicians sent it, and Adam Schefter tweeted it out. I'm just curious, how close was Sala and the Lions to ever happening? You know, I really have never been able to get a great answer on that. Um, I don't get the sense that it was really close. Obviously, he interviewed. I know that there were segments of Lions fans and also Sala's family. And obviously, like you mentioned, the Michigan legislature, which I had broke, which was a story I had actually broken, like um, about that were, yeah, they wanted Robert Sala to be the guy. They want the hometown guy to be the guy. But keep in mind, too, and I haven't talked to Robert about this, so this is all just my, you know, thousand foot view speculation. Sure. It's hard to go home. And because if you go home and all of his family, most of his family is still here and you don't win, that changes home. And I don't think that that played one way or the other into Robert Sala's decision. I, I think Robert Sala took the best job that he felt was for him. And I don't get the sense that the Lions were even super gung-ho on him being a top candidate at the end of the day. I mean, they really seemed focused on, frankly, Dan Campbell and uh, maybe one or two other guys, Marvin Lewis being one of them, it seemed like. But I, that, to me, is is where it really was, was it just maybe at the end of the day, didn't, it didn't work out. It wasn't a fit. And, you know, Robert Sala got a head coaching job. I think it's a really good head coaching job for him. I think he's going to be in a really good position. I'm curious to see what he does. But... I, I don't get the sense that there was, you know, that was that close to to happening. Like the Jets swooped in or something like that. Like, no, nah, that, that was never the feeling I got. Interesting. No, no, just curious because, again, it just seemed like a lot of people were pushing that narrative. And then when I even brought it up, oh, maybe Jets and Solid were like, oh, no, shut up. Obviously, he's going to line. So just. Uh, oh, it, it, listen, it seemed like that. I mean, it seemed like that in September, October, like even while Matt Patricia still had the job, it seemed like that really up up through the actual hiring cycle up through hey you know robert sala interviewed and they're gonna still go talk to five six more people and he's gonna go talk talk to more people like that's when you're starting to say oh well maybe maybe he's not gonna do it maybe that maybe it's going to go a different direction and that was also frankly for my purposes when i started hearing the name dan campbell a little bit more yeah. um and and they really dan campbell really impressed the lions on his first interview with them uh and enough to bring him back and then obviously make him their coach and we've all seen what's happened since all right well uh, michael i want to thank you so much for giving us some insight on a player i don't think a lot of jet uh, jet fans uh, quite frankly knew much about so now uh they feel a lot more informed thank you so much for taking the time hey no problem glad to help thanks, thanks.